Hello and welcome to coverage of Grand Prix Providence. I'm Marshall Sutcliffe in the booth with Jacob Van Luner. We're ready to go for our quarterfinals here. We've got a nice one lined up. Seth Manfield on Black Green Delirium playing against Dave Shields. He's also playing Black Green Delirium. In fact, half of our top eight is Black Green Delirium. And uh, so these are just two of them here. You had a chance to uh, look over the list as the players finalize uh, finalize things before beginning the match. What did you notice about the decks? These two are playing nearly identical main decks. The major difference you'll see between the two decks here is that Dave has one copy of Distended Mindbender, where Seth has one copy of Noxious Gear Hulk. Uh, the reason that one card difference can make such a big difference in this matchup is that both players are going to see a lot of their decks. They're going to be flipping cards up off the top, they're going to go to the graveyard, then they're going to have ways to return cards from their graveyard back to their hand, like Liliana the Last Hope or Grapple with the Past. So even though it's only one card different, that one card can make quite the difference here. Yeah, Traverse the Ovenwald, of course, another way that these players can find those silver bullet cards. Now, the difference is interesting as well, right? And and I'm curious about which one you like better, Jake. The the difference between Noxious Gearhulk versus Distended Mindbender in what usually ends up being a pretty grindy matchup here. Which one do you prefer? I think it really depends on when you find it or flip it off the top. Um, I think, you know, in a position where you're behind, the Noxious Gearhulk is way better at getting back into the game. Um, if you're, you know, even somewhat even, I think the Noxious Gearhulk can get you way ahead. However, if you're at parity or ahead, then a card like um, Distended Mindbender Mind is just going to put you so far ahead. It's going to pluck the two most important things out of your opponent's hand in most cases, at which point you're just going to be able to run them over, presumably. Now, one of the most important things here is hitting the opponent with a Grim Flare in the early turns. If you're able to do that, then not only will you be ahead in terms of permanence, but you're also going to have that bigger graveyard, which means that your cards are going to have a lot more options and become a lot more powerful than those cards for your opponent. And your opponent's playing actual the same cards as you, just to a smaller effect. Yeah, well, mission accomplished here for Seth Manfield. He does get to connect with the Grim Flare. Does that give him Delirium? Not quite. He is only one type away. He's got land instant sorcery. And with that Vessel of Nascency on the battlefield also, yeah. it's not long before that Grim Flare becomes a 4-4 trample. Yeah, he can do it at will. Okay, a Grim Flare for Dave Shields, but you can see being on the draw here really punishing Dave, as now Seth can just attack. Another problem here for Dave is that he just didn't have a spot removal spell, especially an inexpensive spot removal spell to get that Grim Flare off the table, where Seth had the grasp. So Dave didn't even have an option to block with his Grim Flare. Uh, he just had his destroyed, and then immediately Seth got to get that trigger, which was huge. And Runa's Path, I'm sorry, was the card that Seth used to get it off the table. Yeah, you can see that at the bottom of the graveyard there. In the meantime, Delirium acquired even further. And Seth is going to crack that Vessel of Nascency and see what he wants to grab. And uh, in the process, grow his Grim Flare up to a 4-4 four -four with Trample that's going to be able to attack right through the opposing Grim Flare and really fuel the fire here for Delirium. At this point, you know, the onus is on Dave to get back into this game, and it's not going to be easy. It's so funny because these decks seem so grindy, and, like, they're really fighting to get back into the game when we've watched them play against vehicles, or even a lot of the time when you watch them play against Blue-White Flash. But here we're watching the mirror match. It really becomes very much a tempo deck because you're trying to get that engine going before your opponent does because we're going to see here that games are often won in this mirror, by Emrakul the Promised End. Not a whole lot happening here. A little, little plotting in the early stages. We are in the top eight, of course, so every pro point matters here. Yeah, both of these players like to take their time 
decisions. Grim Flare for Seth Manfield stayed home. That's pretty interesting. I mean, the thing is, is he doesn't have, he clearly does not have a spot removal spell for Dave's Grim Flare. Uh, Dave, based on what he's seen, has no removal spell for his Grim Flare. So he's thinking, well, I can keep Dave off of Delirium while I have it, meaning that I can start using all of these powered up cards where Dave's stuck, you know, working to get his Delirium. Maybe Seth got punished for that right now. It makes a lot of sense, though. The logic is sound. What is Seth casting here? Grapple with the past. And see what he finds with this. Just going to make sure he keeps hitting his land drops. He pulled a swamp to the front. Yeah, that's what he's going to get. And I don't think he had much else in the way of options there. Weird. I think you're right. Yeah, I mean, he's just flipped over a bunch of grass, a bunch of Lilianas, some more vessels. It's possible that Seth doesn't really have that much action in his hand, even though he was able to hit with that Grim Flare right away and set up the top of his library. Yeah, I mean, that's half the battle is getting Delirium online, but you still have to draw the spells that say Delirium on them to capitalize. Mm-hmm. Also, another indication that Seth may be a little light on gas here as he, with, with that no attack with the flare, taking a little bit more of a defensive posture here in early stages of the quarters. We've also got three other matches going, of course, as we work our way up to the semifinals. Some big names. Osep making an appearance for the first time yeah, in quite buddy. some time. All right, there's Liliana, the last hope for Seth Manfield. This is going to help out quite a bit. Let's see what he does with Liliana. He's going to shrink down. Well, he's rethinking here. Yeah, I mean... Not a ton of great targets here. I think this is the worst we've seen Liliana be when it's been cast this weekend. Still pretty good, though. He's got a traverse here. Okay, this is big. This is really big. Yeah, this is uh, with Delirium, so Seth can go. Yeah, he can set himself, set himself up himself for Ishkana. Threat. On the Ooh, next how about Noxious Gear Hulk? Ooh, and that's what we talked about. Yeah, love that card. It matches up really well against Kalatas. The Noxious Gear Hulk matches up well against the world. <laughs> Bring it on. Love that guy. Seth is playing a land this turn, isn't he? I believe he has. Did he? No. He hasn't yet. Oh, you're right. He did not because last turn he, he got grappled and then got the swamp. So yeah. there's no way that he's already played his land for yeah, this also, turn. Also, he should be one land ahead of Dave. Seth, with the higher seed coming to the top eight, got to choose whether to be on the play or draw. To the shock of no one, he chose to be on the play. Yeah, it would also be unlikely that he would get a Noxious Gear Hulk without having access to six lands in the following turn when his deck has access to a card like Ishkana. Yeah, of note here, Dave Shields will be noting, hey, that was not a swamp that you just played, Seth, meaning that next turn, Noxious Gear Hulk coming down for sure for Seth. And Dave is going to have to craft this next turn with that in mind. Now, there may be nothing that he can do much about it, but th there's always a question when your opponent's going to play a six drop. Well, can they cast it next turn? Are they going to miss a land? Is their land going to be tapped? But Dave actually has that information available to him. Yeah, Dave, uh, with a decision of his own here, I mean, he can cast his own Liliana, I believe, but in doing so, one of the major problems is that, you know, you at best can just attack with Kalatas and get a little bit of a life swing. And Seth's just going to attack back with Noxious Gear Hulk, or he's just going to cast Noxious Gear Hulk, get the Kalatas off the table, and then put Dave in a world of hurt here. Yeah, and I mean, Dave has no attacks as it sits. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a 3-4 versus a 4-4. Four, four. That doesn't yeah. match up well at all. So Dave's going to get a little 
frisky here and go for a grapple with the pest. He needs to find some way to get back into this game. Yeah, he knows he can get that Grim Flayer back. He also found another. Oh, interesting. So depending on what's in his hand, he can get Ishkana and try to set that up for next turn. Or he can just get another Grim Flayer. How's he doing on Delirium? He's got creature, 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 sorcery. So not very good. Get a grapple. Going to the graveyard now. That's right. So he will be three quarters of the way, but that's still pretty far off for, for Dave. Yeah, the card type that he needs to find. Not really available. I mean, he. I, I think he has Pilgrim's Eye in hand, so that's... He does. One way to get it. It's kind of up to Seth, though, right? All right. Well, he found a murder as well, so... It's pretty good. Murder's going to kill Grim Flayer, reduce the blocks to nothing, and let Kalatas attack... Liliana down to three while making a zombie. So big turn there for Dave Shields. That was pretty exciting. Yeah, that was definitely a big turn. I mean, the major problem here now is that he knows what he's up against We're this turn. We're about to get noxious. Yeah. And, and these gear hulks have been absurd every time we've seen any of them cast. Oh, I love this card. Watch this. Bam. Eat up Kalatas. Gain four life. Use Liliana to shrink down one of your creatures, and let's stabilize this board. And it has Menace to boot. The fact that it has Menace to often leads to some real blowouts as when you have access to instant speed removal. So your opponent gets forced to block it with something that doesn't match up well and something that does, and then you're able to just use removal spells to kill two creatures at a time from there on out. Yeah, and it's big enough that they do have to deal with it eventually. Five power is no joke. The life gain affecting races quite often also. Yeah, Dave now with a a way to get this planeswalker off the table, but yeah. So Seth does get to eat up a zombie in that transaction, though, because Dave needed two different attackers to get into Liliana there, and he's got a Grim Flare as a follow-up. Now this is a big turn for Seth. He had a really nice turn last time. The Noxious Gearhook straight up two for one. Got him a life cushion. Got him a big threat, but. If he's out of gas here, he actually could start to fall behind if Dave has any answer for the Gear Hulk. Kill the Gear Hulk and then start crunching with Grim Flares, and the game ends very, very quickly after that. Yeah, and Dave still without Delirium, but it seems that he could find it pretty quickly if he wanted to at this point. Seth attacks for five. Dave does not double block. Yeah, that wouldn't really be advisable to give him the, the full three for one, especially when his deck has so many ways to get cards back from the graveyard because the problem with killing a card like Noxious Gear Hulk when you're playing against Seth Manfield's deck is that then it comes down and two for ones you again. And this was another really nice turn for him. Mind Rack Demon into Grim Flare for Seth Manfield. I, I was speculating, well, what if he's out of gas? Well, that was for not because he has plenty of it. Mind Rack Demon, another card that seems to have gotten quite a bit better. That 4 5 body with flying is really well positioned against the current format. It matches up well against Archangel Avacyn. It matches up well against Smuggler's Copter, even when there's a Dipala in play or if it's crewed up by a veteran motorist. It's just a lot to be said for a 4-5 flyer. 
You mean flampler? A flampler? Mm. It says right on there. Yeah, that that is an interesting word, flample. It's a technical term. Pilgrim's Eye for Dave. <laughs> and this Pilgrim's Eye, if it does die, if the eye does die, then he will have delirium. Well, there's a Liliana. This is also going to give him a shot at delirium. I think he did it. Yeah, looks like he found it. And there's right. Ishkana back as well. The grind is very real. We remember this matchup from last season, and this actually does play out pretty similarly to how that matchup played. Uh, yeah. You know, we, we've seen more trimmed down, aggressive versions of Black Green Delirium uh, that, you know, like Eric Froelich popularized at the Pro Tour and uh, subsequently wrote an article about and such. Um, that deck seems to have been performing quite well, but that's not the one that we see here between Seth and Dave. They're opting for a, a little bit bigger, a little bit more mid-range, a little less punchy version of it. And if you remember these matchups from, from last season, this is quite similar to that. Yeah, I mean, it's a great choice for this weekend, obviously, having made, you know, four players make the top eight. But one of the things that I really like about choosing to play Black Rain Delirium is that last weekend, uh, the pr most popular deck at the Pro Tour was Aetherworks Marvel, which really beats up on Black Green Delirium. And this weekend, these guys knew nobody's going to show up with Marvel. Black Green Delirium is going to be really well positioned. It's gonna, just going to get to play against nice matchups all weekend. Yeah, red-white vehicles and such where they've got answers to everything. They can come back if, if, if they get behind. And we've seen that happen, by the way. The vehicle starts look very good, sort of no matter what they're playing against. But man, Ishkanaz and Kalatas and such does a really nice job of, of shoring up a deficit. But yeah, these matches tend to go for a while, as you can see. If you're watching along at home, go get a sandwich. Yeah, we'll feel be free. Here. We'll be here. Seth's going to think for a bit. We're standing. Oh, almost. All right, so Seth has decided in the end that the Noxious Gear Hulk is going to attack Liliana while the Grim Flare, I believe, is attacking Dave. I'm not sure which is attacking which, but... I, I know the Noxious Gear Hulk is attacking Liliana, but he just tapped the Grim Flare. It's the kind of thing where if we were sitting next to him, we could have heard him say, you know, verbalize what his intention was. But. And, I mean, these are really important combat steps where they're playing for pro points, both of these people. Very competitive. Both had quite a bit of success in Magic. May I please have player Mario Martinez to registration, please? Yeah, Dave Mario Shields, another uh, Callblade master. We watched Ben Stark earlier. Wow, th this match is just going at snail speed here. This one combat <laughs> has taken like three minutes or something. Seth deciding yeah. how he wants to attack, and then Dave deciding how he wants to block. Now they're going to look at their hands for a while. Cameron Wilson, 
This, this could, this one could take a while. Like I said, if you're getting sandwiches, <laughs> it might, it might. get an extra one. <laughs> grab some more sandwiches. napkins. If you're getting sandwiches, bring, bring a pair of them down to the convention yeah, center. Yeah, you're gonna need it. <laughs> All right. Well, that did resolve though, and Liliana gets taken down by Noxious Gear Hulk, and then one of the Grim Flayers ended up trading. That leaves Dave Shields with just Grim Flayer and a Pilgrim's Eye. But on the other side, Seth has some beef. I mean, he's got some a Mind Rack Demon and a Noxious Gear Hulk. Those are some big creatures. And they are quite handily outclassing what Dave has right now. Yeah, I mean, Seth has been ahead every step of the way this game. The onus is really on Dave to catch up. And they're do th both doing a quick delirium check as well. Yeah, I'm assuming that both players types. have an Emrakul in their deck, right? The, yes. The one of? They each have one copy. Okay. So they each like a count on each other's graveyards. Looks like six there for Manfield. I believe only five for Dave. Okay. No artifact. This interesting uh, ruinous path sitting that Mind Rack Demon. Dave had the mana that he could have used to awaken a land, but chose not to. That is very interesting, and Seth is certainly going to take note of that. Now, he may find out what the answer to that little problem is just in the second main phase, but if he doesn't, he'll have to assume that he has some type of removal spell. Speaking of removal, Seth with the Grasp of Darkness, leaving Dave with just the lowly pilgrim's eye. All right, so remember the Ishkana from before? He also had an untapped land, so that was the plan there. Dave astutely, though, waiting until post-combat to show what, his, what he had going on. Oh, and here's Emrakul, the promise, and for Seth Manfield. Let's see Pretty if he can good. use this to finish the game. With uh, Dave being out of gas here and no cards left, you've got to think that Seth is going to be able to leverage that into a victory. It is just so big. And, I mean, at this point, it's also very hard to kill, especially with that ruinous path in the graveyard. Yeah, and of course, two creatures are going to die. Seth is just going to run them into his much bigger, much sweeter creatures, it must be said. So this is a big draw step for, for Dave. If he bricks here, it's going to be incredibly difficult to come back. Seth gets to untap with all that mana. Attack for lethal, force some double blocks on the Noxious Gear Hulk. Dave's going to take 13 in the air. I think it was a land that he drew. All right, so Seth is getting rowdy here. He's going to jam with everything. This is really putting the heat on Dave Shields. Emrakul, the promised end, delivering on her promise here with the exception of one draw step from Dave. And Dave now. These blocks have Dave taking 13 and falling to three, but effectively trading off his entire board for everything from Seth outside of just Emrakul. This is a big draw step, and it's a swamp, and that's going to be game one. All right, so Seth Manfield takes a drawn-out but hard-fought game one against Dave Shields, and Dave is going to need to find back-to-back -back wins against the former world champ there, Seth Manfield, and that is not going to be easy. It wasn't a long game, even, in terms of number of turns played. Right. Maybe eight or nine turns per player. A lot happening in those eight or nine turns, though. Indeed, they were action-packed. Yeah, as soon as uh, Seth got ahead early on there with the Grim Flare, 
things really looked good for him. He was able to cast his own Grim Flare while on the play, then use a removal spell to clear the way for it. And once he started churning things out into his graveyard, the pressure was just on Dave, and uh, he could never really catch up. Let's take a look at uh, Osip Labidovich playing against Maxine. What do you, how do you want to say it? Belanger. Belanger. All right. Belanger. Belanger. Yeah, Belanger. I like Belanger. He's um, Canadian. Though that doesn't mean that he uses the French pronunciation of the name necessarily. By the way, this looks like a savage beating here from Osip, who, of note, already up a game. Maxime sitting behind four spiders and our old friend, the Sylvan Advocate there. Oh, making a comeback. Yeah. One of the things I really, really like about Osip's build of the deck is his post-board ability to just play so many Planeswalkers, especially in this green-black Delirium matchup. We've watched so many of these vehicle decks just get completely destroyed by green-black decks throughout the weekend, and every time we watch Osip's vehicle deck, it's playing against one of these decks that supposedly crushes him, and he just starts chaining out Planeswalkers. And the Planeswalkers are an actual nightmare for these Delirium decks. They don't apply the kind of pressure that you need to really get something like a Gideon, Ally of Zendikar, or Chandra, Torch of Defiance, off the table. Looks like Maxim is going to try to apply pressure to Gideon here with a Hissing Quagmire as well as the uh, Sylvan Advocate that we mentioned earlier, Jake. I might be wrong. He might actually just be trying to go for Osip's life total here. Well, that doesn't look right, does it? I think he may just be blocking this, this four or five. Yeah, this looks weird all to block with three. What, does he have an emblem in there? What am I? Oh, they're, oh, they're all knights. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That looks right. Oh, yeah. I mean, I was thinking they were one ones, and I'm like, this looks weird. Oh, I, I. But they are definitely not. All right, so. I understand that. Osip's just going to trade off two of his tokens and take four. But this is a savage backswing that Osip has lined up here. That is a Sky Sovereign in play. Sky Sovereign has been so good for Osip, also. Have you seen how well he's done with that thing in the blue-white matchups? Yes, it's looked really good for him. I mean, there's a limit to how many you can run. It's legendary, and it costs five mana, but my God, it has been a beating. And we've watched that thing just pressure cards like Spell Queller, Giselle the Broken Blade, uh, Reflector Mage. It's just killing all of these things. Yes. Meanwhile, it's just this insanely huge flying attacker that's resistant to sorcery speed removal. Speaking of, by the way, this is a very lethal attack here from Osip. And he's, is he going to be in the semis? Attention. Yes, he is. Wow. Osip, not only back on the Pro Tour, but he's in the semifinals with a quick two games to zero win here in the quarters. Ooh. We're going to be doing exciting. a little, little trophy presentation with Osip later today? Oh, that would be very exciting. He had, what, one involved. buy? We, we, we covered him in round two, so he yep. could have a maximum of one buy. As of it turns out, he's pretty good at playing Magic. <laughs> they're, they're, they're still sideboarding, of course, over here. Yeah, it's, they need to take their time. Magic players need Legacy Plus. Please head over to the pretty exciting stuff. Pro Tour champion. Magic players need Legacy yeah. Plus. into the semis. Both of these guys here. I'm going to pencil Grand him in on my champions. That's right. Dave Shields has won Grand Prix. Top eight at a few also. Seth. I haven't seen Dave around for a little while, though. Yeah, I, I don't think he had a ton of buys. Hasn't been traveling, He's, maybe? Maybe yeah, I just missed him, but I, I haven't I haven't seen, seen that much of him either. Of GPs, yeah. Seen a lot of Seth. Yep, we have been seeing a lot of Seth. Seth really just put on a clinic last year at the World Championship. So many people were... Uh, surprised by what they saw from him. They knew he was good, but they didn't realize just how good he was. And the way he was able to play those matches, the way he was able to you know, just dominate the tournament, it was a really amazing showing from him.
Oh, good. Oh, I thought that there was a, a break being had. No, no, no. I was saying oh, good because they're shuffling. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yes. Oh, oh, we oh. are moving ever closer to game number two here between Seth Manfield and Dave Shields. Yeah, these two definitely know each other. The same generation of skilled magician. Planeswalkers yeah, of Seth, the same class. Seth has had a really interesting career. Yeah. Yeah, he won a GP in like 2007 when he was very young still. He mm -hmm. was a teenager. And then, you know, he was kind of around and not around and then around. And then he won another GP and it's like, oh, Seth. Hey, then all of a sudden he just exploded and had, you know, one of those seasons that you just dream about. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> topping off a season with a world championship win is yep. certainly that the was kind the of beginning of his we, season. You're right, it was. Yeah, like he started it off with a championship win, and he rode that wave. I mean, the only thing that could knock him off was Owen Turtwinald. Like you know, from, from <laughs> and, and even then, it took Owen until the last Multiple tournament tries. down to the top eight to win that player of the year. It was incredible stuff. All right, let's take a look at one of, our, one of our other matches. We've got Jackie Wang playing against Ian Bosley here. And uh, this is red-white vehicles. Now, black-red zombie madness. You know, this is a hard deck to name. Yeah. It's got some <laughs> zombies, but it's not really a zombie deck. It's got some madness cards, but it's not really a madness deck. So we kind of just put it all into one, and I think that it, it covers it. Like, when you see that, you go, oh, right, that deck, the one with the, with the Crypt Breakers and some madness cards and stuff like that. Also, clearly taking advantage of graveyard synergies here. You see Haunted Dead from Jackie. By the way, this is game three. And Jackie Wang looks like he's in a good spot. Yeah, really starting to assemble that huge board that this Black Red Zombie deck can do. Yeah, now he can start either attacking for a bunch of damage or even activating his, uh, his Crypt Breaker to draw cards. He does have three zombies at this point. Oh, Skywhaler shot, though, is going to make the race difficult. Not a huge deal, right? I mean, Jackie's not going to shed too many tears about his uh, scrounger hitting the graveyard. It's not that bad to, to trade a full card when you just get to buy the thing back. But, you know, in a tempo situation, a situation where time is of the essence, that, that does actually matter. Yeah, and I mean, Ian here really having to take a controlling posture if he wants to get back into the game, which is... You know, not where he wants to be as a red-white vehicles deck. No, well, he's having none of it, JVL. He's attacking. Yeah, I mean, he's ahead on life total. Finds a pair of Depala to go with the one that he already has there. A little awkward. He's not going to be able to cast those. If he has nothing else to do with his mana, maybe he just casts one to untap it, essentially. Yeah. So here we go. Jackie is going to make another zombie and throw a whole bunch of blocks in front of the Depala. Before that, he's going activate to activate his Crypt Breaker to draw a card and lose a life. But I'm predictably, the replacement Depala hits Battlefield here. What, what were you saying, Jake? I'm surprised you really need to put that many resources into getting the Depala off the table, especially when you just saw that he put two additional copies into his hand. You know the card's legendary. Yeah, I mean, it's just tough because he doesn't want to take the damage. Yeah, don't think I he wanted it's a to chomp. Thing. Yeah, but you're right. Like, you're kind of playing into the hand that your opponent has. I mean, two Depaulas in hand. It's tempting to try to just strand them. But, oh, here's the madness and the zombie side of the equation. He's going to make a zombie with Crypt Breaker and Madness out, Fiery Temper, to kill the next Depaula. So, Jackie, you know, like I said, he's not, he's kind of playing into the game plan of Bosley here, as, as we saw him having two additional copies of Depala by using actual cards to kill Depala, but still he's he's on that grind. There's also a selfless spirit here for Jackie, but that might not be that great if Jackie can get that haunted dead in the graveyard. Doesn't seem like it would be too hard. Oh, cancel that order. He doesn't even need it. Liliana and Jackie Wang is moving very close to the semifinals himself. I can tell you that our main match is underway, but 
no, we're not going back there. We're going to stay here. Yeah. We'll let them <laughs> we'll sort let them out marinate a little bit. Yeah, their first few uh, <laughs> turns of the game. Because I want to see, A, how this ends. I mean, this is a game three. And B, this, ga this game just looks way more exciting. These players are playing quickly, and there's a lot of damage flying around the table here. All right, well, he hit a veteran motorist off of that DePaul yeah, activation. He good. has been hitting. He also spent some of his mana to activate Needle Spires and send that in. Ian Bosley, just with the full aggros here, just running into everything that Jackie's throwing at him. But Jackie has Crypt Breaker going, and that looks really, really good. Crypt Breaker has just been doing so well. It absolutely has. All right, so Jackie's going to trade off a bit of his board here. But again, he gets to lose a life and draw a card. Yeah, and you see that, that that was careful move by Ian Bosley. The double block was with the Haunted Dead and the zombie on DePaula, and Ian did not want Haunted Dead to end up in the graveyard. I think Jackie did, so it probably would have been better for him to, to put the double block with the Haunted Dead on the Needle Spires there. Because yeah, both was of those able creatures were going to die in such a way, and yeah. and just not finish off the haunted dead, and that has to be better in the graveyard, you know, rather than a zombie token being gone for Jackie. So maybe a missed opportunity for him. We'll see how it goes, though. He's getting something back with Liliana here. I didn't see what he actually grabbed. We know we know for sure that he had a scrap heap scrounger in the yard at least. Yeah, and uh, here we see two lands in hand for Jackie Wang, so it would have been much better for that Haunted Dead to have been in the yard. Yeah, for sure. It still looks like he's in good shape to me, but mm -hmm. those little tiny things can come back to get you, so we'll see. It can all add up. Now, in the meantime, Haunted Dead's going to jam for two. We know that there's a veteran motorist in hand for Ian. There it is. Whoa, two Gideons on top? You want both of them or just one of them? I imagine he wants at least one. At least one. Yeah. This Crypt Breaker, though, kind of doing a little bit of a Gideon impression itself. Oh, that thing is putting in serious. It looks like a pack rat right now. <laughs> That's the good news. With the two lands in hand, he still has plenty to do with them. Crypt does not care what you discard. And that Crypt Breaker has been on the battlefield since we joined this game, Jake, and it has not left. And that's a major issue for Bosley, who's found decent threats. Chained together a few DePaulas. He's got a veteran motorist now, but Jackie really using that Breaker to his advantage. Yeah, and there we see that sick interaction we've seen so many times this weekend where Liliana, the last hope, just gets to point and click kill a veteran motorist. She just looks over at it, and the motorist yeah. is like screech out of the yeah, yeah. parking lot. It's really bad. Like, killer stare. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Gideon for Ian. We knew that was coming. But you gotta like Jackie's position here. Oh, of course. He's just able to overpower. He can just kill Gideon. I mean, now, Jackie can just turn all... Can he just kill Ian? All of his creatures sideways. Two unknown card, or maybe one unknown, at least at least one unknown card from Jackie's perspective for Ian in his hand. If he turns everything sideways and, Jack and Ian goes, block, kill your thing, then it's not lethal, right? That's two creatures disappearing there, so it would be just a little bit short at five damage, I believe. He could plus the Liliana before the attack. Mm -hmm. But still, he's got to be worried. I mean, Gideon attacks for five on his own. He's at six. It's true. Is there another Needle Spires in there somewhere? I don't think there is. It doesn't look like any non-basic lands beside that pair there. Ooh, this is interesting. Jackie's deciding what he wants to do. He also has to decide if he's going to go for the kill, he can do that, or he can go for Gideon. Oh, 
it was a Skywhaler shot in hand for Bosley as well. So he actually had that scenario. Yeah. But the good news for Jackie is this didn't really hurt him that badly. He's still getting in for damage. He's trading off card for card and then token for token. And Ian's down to two now, and he still has a Crypt Breaker back, plus Liliana to grab him whatever else he wants. And, with, and he also just got a prized amalgam in his graveyard. Oh, did he? Oh, that's So deuce. now he's returning the one scrounger to his hand. Yeah, it doesn't look like he can actually cast the prize amalgam. He can discard it to Crypt Breaker, though. And then, but I don't think he wants to do that right now. Maybe he does. I like waiting. Because it makes your plan deceptive. And that does it. Jackie Wang is into the semifinals. Good stuff there. That is black, red, zombie. I'm writing this down. <laughs> it's a lot of words. A lot of words. <laughs> Madness. Dot com. All right, so he's through. <laughs> we know that Osip is through as well. That leaves two matches left, Seth Manfield and Dave Shields, which we're going to jump back to in the middle of game two. Also, Zachary Keeney is playing against Yishin Wang. That is white-blue versus black-green. Which there. I imagine will, might become the classic matchup of this format. Mm. Could be, could be. Well, these red-white decks are definitely a, uh, a pillar as well. Yeah, yeah. Either the red, white, or the Mardu version are, are the real deal for sure. Interesting. I feel like we saw so much more of these four color and Mardu versions throughout the weekend. And now that we get to the top eight, it's just two straight red, white versions. It's true. Uh, I am it might be somewhat that. telling. All right. Ruinous Path is going to kill a tireless tracker, leaving Seth Manfield with no threats and a clue. Versus Dave Shields, who also has no threats, but a Liliana on five loyalty. Magic players in the Tuesday Threat acquired. Seth Manfield has a Mind Rack Demon. I can't quite see exactly, but I'm sure he has Delirium at this point. I see yeah, I saw creatures, instants, lands, and sorceries already. Yeah, so I guess I can see. <laughs> and uh, so that'll set him up to not be taking a bunch of damage. And uh, Dave says, hey, if you're going to make a flyer, I'll make a flyer. Unfortunately, the you know, Flample yeah. that we've spoken about yeah. already. I'm talking about Also, the three extra power and the four extra toughness yeah, yeah. <laughs> does tend to overshadow the Pilgrim's Eye a little here. Liliana's up to six loyalty, but that may be plummeting soon unless Dave has an answer. Now, if Dave does have murder or something like that, heck, you know what's kind of funny? Pilgrim's Eye actually could matter here if what he has is Grasp yeah. of Darkness. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see what happens. Because if he does, he could be in really good shape hiding and trying to maximize on Liliana going for ultimate or something along those lines. Block. It's back on Seth. Seth has to pass priority if he wants to. Oh, Dave doesn't have it, though, so he's just going to use it to reduce the trample damage by one. Which does mean, though, that Liliana only takes one. He yeah, really wants to work toward this ultimate here. He's trying, but th this is not a winning proposition as it sits. Yes, it looks like Seth did have some mana issues this game, but he's getting out of that pretty quickly. Dave still has a bunch of cards in hand, so a lot of the time, and we've spoken about this earlier, uh, a lot of the time this matchup comes down to who casts a Miracle of the Promised End first. And even though Dave looks to be falling behind here, the, uh, the chance of him being able to just cast and rock with the promise end first is a pretty attractive thing oh, but just a land in hand that's right Seth says all right let's see what you're working with well it's a forest not particularly exciting oh is that a traverse off the top for Dave that was look he's checking traverse. his graveyard not only looking for One. delirium but also <laughs> how much so let's see if we can get a look here so it's ruinous path that's one pilgrim's eye that's three mm-hmm 
and then, it and looks then like a two other sorceries and uh, and a thing. So he's got he's mm-hmm. only at three right now. So even awkward. the traverse isn't good enough. No, it's not. It's really awkward, and he he won't even want to play it most likely. Like he needs to get to delirium. He will when Liliana dies. That's true, and I mean he may just want to minus this Liliana to give himself delirium here, and then he could go find Ishkana or something like that. It's difficult. I mean, he needs to have Liliana get attacked here, right? Like, part of the equation. Well, I'm saying by milling himself with the Liliana ability. Just he trying could to get hit? there. Yeah. Because, I mean, I don't think you're Oof. just... I don't, I don't think... That would let him do the, it this turn. The plan of let me... Let my opponent kill my Planeswalker mm-hmm. is exactly where I want to be. No, it's not. It's definitely not. It's it's a bit of a gamble though cuz if he misses, yeah, then Liliana's real dead. Yeah. And he has no creatures right now in his yard. I guess it's pretty tough to miss on everything though. He'd have yeah. to mill like sorcery, sorcery something. And he's pretty far behind as it is too. Like he kind of needs to yeah. it, like the no, the whole right. ultimate plan is kind of oh, that's gone, gone by now. That you is know? gone. Yeah, that is gone. It's not going to happen anymore. No. Well, he, he decided to let Liliana take one for the team here, and unfortunately for him, Seth has found Ishkana Graf Widow, and that is the type of card that can start to really put this thing away. Yeah, it's a really tough spot here for Dave. He found a Grim Flare off the top of his library, which is fine, but he still doesn't even have Delirium yet. Yeah, and I mean, Grim Flare at this stage of the game is not what you're looking for. No. In turn two, you know, it's such a powerhouse, but yeah. here... All right, well, he's going to guarantee hitting Delirium by putting Liliana into his graveyard. And he was... Now, now just to recap, at the beginning of the game, or the match, you were looking at the deck list and you noticed that there was one major difference in the cards. And we saw yeah. that difference really come into play in game one. That was Seth Manfield playing Noxious Gear Hulk and kind of taking over from there. Yeah. The other side was Dave. He had Distended Mindbender. Yeah. Is that even the type of card he wants at this point? No, it, it doesn't help him back in the game. And that's kind of what we talked about with the, you know, the difference between those two cards in this particular matchup. When one player has one, one player has the other. Dave, once he's ahead, is better at closing this game. However, Seth can get back into the game better. And, you know, it's also worth noting the Noxious Gear Hulk, while it is better at getting back into the game, it's also pretty good when you're ahead. Yes, it is. It, is. it does <laughs> close the door on the game quite nicely. So, interestingly, Dave actually took the Pilgrim's Eye out of his graveyard. So now he's got Planeswalker, Creature, Sorcery. So he no longer has Delirium from what I can see from here. No, I, I think you're right. Which is somewhat awkward for him as now all of a sudden that Traverse the Oven Wall doesn't do anything anymore. <laughs> oh, things are looking pretty rough here for Dave. Now he's down a Planeswalker, doesn't have anything relevant to do for the turn. And he's sitting on Forest Traverse, no Delirium, and a 1-1. One, one. Yikes. Certainly not where he wants to be. No. Seth Manfield may be poised it's to push on to the semifinals here. He looks to be in a really strong spot. Yeah. And he's going to take advantage of it by jamming with the team here. This is an attack for 10. Dave is going to soak up three of it, give himself Delirium back, but take seven in the process. And Seth hasn't even tapped mana yet. That was all... <laughs> that was the easy part. So what Dave really wants to do here at this point, if he wants to win the game, is cast him Rockle the Promised End. And he's way off, right? I think he only has five types. Four. Four. He had three, and then he, and then he added Pilgrim's Eye. Creature, sorcery. Yeah, he doesn't have a land yet. You're right. Right. 
So that means so. that he needs nine lands available and Emrakul in hand to make that happen. Yeah, so he's one short in the following turn. Yeah, well, and he needs to draw Emrakul as well. So, you know, he has yeah. Traverse to find it, but then that takes up one of the lands for the turn. Yeah, that's This what I mean. is not looking good. And meanwhile, Seth drawing extra cards with clues. Now has this vessel ready to go, find him whatever he needs. Ooh, and Seth now with a traverse of his own. This is Seth going and finding a rock of the promised end of his own. And I mean, what's really scary about it coming from Seth, too, is that even if Dave has a card, mm -hmm. you know, some type of sorcery speed removal or something that's able to get that and rock off the table, that he's able to draw off the top of his deck before Seth can just use it on whatever, then Seth on Dave's turn can just completely demolish him by, you know, forcing his hand empty. Yeah. Yeah, this is looking real tough for Dave here. Here's the Traverse. Kind of pause at Emrakul there, but I think he's looking and going, that doesn't do it, that doesn't do it. He's going to get the Mindbender, which he can cast with the land drop here, but it's still just maybe too late. Like, it it's not the thing... Good. It's fine, but it's not really the things in Manfield's hand that are the problem at this point, right? I mean, he's facing yeah. a lot of power and toughness. Oh, he went and got an Emrakul. Okay. Just decided. This is it. Okay. That would be next turn that he can cast it with a land drop. still have his count at four for Delirium. He's got I believe eight so. Lands. He hasn't gotten any extra. Yeah, he's got eight lands, so he'd need to hit one more land by next turn that's untapped. And then he could cast Emrakul. Is he, is he looking at 13 damage, though? There's three, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve from the Quagmire. So no. Dave could go to one and then play Emrakul. I, maybe too late. It, it may be, be too late anyway. Okay, well, that helps. It does. Grim Flare. And he's got that forest in his hand as Dave as well. So he will be able to cast the Emrakul next turn. The Grim Flare can help him uh, stave off a little extra damage. So Seth is going to start planning out for two-turn kill here. Yeah, I imagine Seth's just going to send everything this turn when he attacks. Hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. It seemed very unlikely for anything else there to happen. All right, well, there's a Grasp of Darkness just to make sure that maximum damage gets piled on. Ten. That's ten, yeah. Yeah. Fall down to three, Dave. Then he gets to play Emrakul. You know, Seth still gets the rest of his turn, too. Let's not forget that. And remember, we know that one of the cards in his hand is the Miracle of the Promised End. That's right. But He's a little off from casting at this point. Yeah, going to need a bit more mana. Vessel. Hmm. Oh, there's a not Nixilis. Seth, down to yeah, just two mana for pretty this good card. Turn, but yeah, Nixilis could do, do some work next turn, if uh, even if Dave does fire off his own copy. Yeah, post-board, their decks do get quite a bit different. Seth has access to Omnixilis, Reignited. Seth also has access to Flying Tendrils, a card we've talked about a bit this week and that we didn't really see at all. Mm -hmm. Doesn't look great in this matchup, though, right? Oh, no, not at all. 
But a card that you and I have noted on multiple times versus a vehicle stack that, ooh, that would be really good right here. Yeah, that would, could just win the game. So, some more decision making going on here. He took the forest. It played the forest now. He sure did. <laughs> <laughs> okay, he's finally passed the turn back to Dave. All right, so here we're going to see a, a big spell. Yeah, it's going to be Emrakul. He needs to tap out to do it, but there we go. Emrakul, the promised end. Yep. So and Seth used up a grasp of darkness there just to get it out of his own hand. He didn't kill anything with it. He targeted Ishkana knowing that it wouldn't die, but it means that Dave has less to work with on Seth's turn here, especially with in combination with the Liliana there. You know, in combination with Liliana, that's enough to take down, for example, the demon. Yeah, now, even having cast the Simrock of the Promised End, they even a really rough spot here. Like, he may be forced to... This is a really tough spot for Dave. Yeah, yeah, he just can't see any way out of this. Remember, Seth gets a turn after that. So Dave says, you got me. Seth Manfield wins two games to zero and puts himself into the semi-finals. A nice uh, smile out of the two guys. Yeah. That's going to be Jackie Wang versus Seth in the next one. And uh, that's going to do it for our quarterfinal here from Providence. Ready to take your game to the next level and start on the path to the Pro Tour? Rise to the challenge and test your skills at a local preliminary Pro Tour qualifier. To find an event near you, visit magic.wizards.com slash pptq. Kaladesh is now available on Magic Duels. Build endless deck combinations with more than 1,000 unique cards. Play through hours of story with 50 campaign missions. Play Magic Duels free today on Xbox One, Steam, iPad, and iPhone.